Great, should we get going? Because I don't want to miss a minute today. We've got some um, great panelists to um, to, to uh, chat to today and we've got some good questions that have come in as well. Um, so thanks so much for being here, everyone. You're at the um, webinar where we're going to be discussing um, how to achieve gender parity in the boardroom, uh, what we can do to you know, make sure that female leaders do, do make it through to the boardroom. And so without further ado, I'd like to go around and uh, let our panel introduce themselves. Um, so we shall start with you, Jackie, since you're at the top of my screen. <laughs> Coming off mute always helps. There you go, I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah, um, my name's Jackie Cupper. Um, up until June of last year, I was the global head of FM for GlaxoSmithKline. I retired at that time, um, only to be um, exceptionally busy. Um, now working with Liz Kentish and with another consulting organisation, consulting in the FM space. Um, but I'm here today, um, obviously off the back of what Liz and I co-founded together, which is Plan B for FM. Um, which is aimed at getting women on boards. Fantastic, and Liz? Thanks Nikki, and hi everybody. Liz Kentish, uh, founder and managing director of Kentish & Co. And as Jackie said, co-founder with alongside Jackie of Plan B Mentoring for FM. Lovely, thank you, and Inga? Yeah, hi everyone, uh, Inga Wokstra. I'm the CEO of the Big Fish Academy. And what we do at the Big Fish Academy is helping those people that are driving diversity and inclusion to be successful in their roles. So we help the teams making this happen. And my own expertise, uh, which is why I'm mostly here today, is in gender diversity. And I do a lot of work in gender diversity in uh, tech and engineering. So one of the things I did, I, I wrote a book on gender difference, Be Gender Smart which is specifically aimed at women and helping them make the most of how they potentially work differently uh, from a male style of working. And when I work with organizations, I apply that to how do you recruit women? How are you attractive to women? How do you make sure women get promoted uh, at the same rate as men do? How do you make sure you retain women? So that's very much applicable as well, those lessons um, to boards. How do you get women to apply to boards? How do you make it attractive to them? And how do you make sure they, they stay? Fantastic, thank you. And Gemma, do you want to say hi, my co-host? Uh, hi, everybody. It's uh, Gemma Williams, obviously, uh, from JLL. I'm very, very passionate about the inclusion and diversity space. And it's fantastic to have the three of you on this call because as a female leader, I was actually a recipient of the JLL Leadership uh, Award for 2020. This is really something that's close to my heart. So I'm really looking forward to, to this space uh, and hearing from you guys today. So thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. I think probably the easiest thing to do, I think, when we, we were chatting about, um, you know, what our attendees to these webinars really, really want um, is, is definitely that the fireside chat approach um, definitely seems to work. So, so should we kind of jump straight in with some burning questions that um, some of our attendees have, have already put to us? Um, so the first is, what do the panellists see as the key blockers to getting gender parity in the boardroom? Now, I know, Inga, that you like to talk about enablers rather than blockers. Um, um, but I think, you know, that that's probably quite, quite key that people really want to understand, you know, what is going wrong? Where are we? So, so do you want to kick off with that, Inga? Yeah, reason I like to, rather than look at the blockers, which are actually sort of very familiar and it's really easy to get stuck into, oh, it's really difficult for women and men are keeping them out and women aren't confident enough. And, you know, you get really negative sort of vibe to it and which is oh women don't want it which apparently is women don't have the confidence which is apparently a uh, man don't want women in you know and there are like uh, old boys networks keeping women out and I think it's actually much um much more um, powerful and, and empowering to look at what works for the women that are getting in there which is why I like to look at enablers and enablers are creating a board that women enjoy being part of, and I'll come to some tips later on, right? I imagine, so I'll make it more practical, but creating a play, creating something that looks attractive to women and that women are aware of. And I, if you do that, then it becomes a lot easier. And then obviously being aware that men and women may have different styles, different ways of putting themselves forward, 
different ways of talking about their achievements so they actually look interesting you know board met, boards often say oh well we just can't find the talent well what is the talent you're looking for what are the skills you're looking for what is the expertise you're looking for and to actually perhaps look at that differently I think that's much more powerful than yeah than looking at barriers and trying to take away barriers right yeah absolutely I know that one of the things from starting to read read your book and it's a great read so so thanks for doing for writing that and one of the things that you you are keen to say is that, that, that we are different and we do approach things in different ways so let's stop trying to pretend that we are or we aren't but you know let's embrace that and let, let's see how we can how we can ensure that more people are you know getting through to you know where is it going wrong basically um so what recommended actions could we be taking in companies or as individuals you know what who should who should be looking at this should it be the individual should it be companies should it be society you know wh where do we start with this where do we start to unpack it all well I think there is a lot women themselves can do and I think Liz and Jackie have the keys there you know so I'll, I'll leave that side to Liz and Jackie mm -hmm. uh, whereas I often look at the other side working with the organization or working with the board mm -hmm. or, I mean recently I worked with an HR team who said we want to make sure women get promoted at the same rate as men. So I ran a workshop for them. You know, we look at all the things that, um, that enable women. And one of the first things is to use gender inclusive language in your recruitment, right? So if you're looking to attract women, then you need to use language that sounds attractive to women. Mm. And I mean, there's a, a really good app to, if you wanna know what kind of language that is or what maybe the current way you write about that, whether that is gender inclusive which is uh, Kat Matsfield. Shall I throw that in the chat? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Go. Kat Matsfield. The live captioning doesn't seem to, <laughs> doesn't seem to pick that up very, very well. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, yeah, really useful. And I mean, the sort of thing you'll find in there is, for instance, that the sort of words that really resonate with men. Are we looking for a top person, a real expert who's the best in, let's say, finance or... Uh, who can lead our team, you know, those sort of words are, are very male and typically are attractive to men. And, and we know this from research, right? This is not something I've, I've sort of made up, you know, there is like a lot of research and you'll read that in the app uh, more about that actually. Then the city, you need to sort of change that in the sort of words that are more attractive to women. We're looking for someone who knows their subject, who uh, informs and support decision-making, facilitate, uh, join in, you know, these are words uh, that, that describe more of a, are more attractive to women. So that's one gender inclusive language. Second is to really build relationships uh, with women. So to look at, well, wh where is our target group? You know, and that's the same if you're looking for more ethnic diverse people, for instance, as well, where are those people? You know, where could they be? Where are, where are there more of them? than maybe in your current network. So to look beyond your networks, to look at where could we potentially find those women and put some extra effort in finding them and then asking them. Because somehow, I mean, if you speak to top women and you ask, how did you get into this role? They said, well, there was someone really supporting me, my boss or someone else. Well, I wasn't sure I was gonna do it, but someone asked me. So that's a really powerful one. Men are more likely to put themselves forward to think, hey, I'm quite good at this. I think people really need me. Whereas women, yeah, aren't, yeah, often speak about that differently and would, would be more like, if you ask them and explain why you need them, they will happily jump at the chance. Mm. I've got four, can I do two more? Uh, yes, of course, yeah, please yeah. do. <laughs> please, please, absolutely. Number three is uh, make it really easy to enter. And I think that is also where Jackie and Liz come in with their program, their plan B program. Mm -hmm. But there are other things you can do. So making it easy and risk-free to enter works really well. So what am I thinking of? Open days, taste to taste days, join the board for yeah, three times and shadow with someone, somehow making it less... Um, yeah, le less sort of dangerous to enter, easier to enter, less, um, what do you call that one? Daunting. Daunting, that's the word, thank you. <laughs> Making it less daunting to enter. Mm. And there is a lot you can do on having conversations with people. If you've already built a relationship with someone, you know, widening your network, picking up the phone and saying, hey, we're thinking about you, you know, that already makes it less daunting too. And when you, 
when you do that, and I spoke with um, the chair of a board and he said, yeah, I did that. I spoke to some of those women and then they, and then they said, oh, no, no, I'm not interested. And I said, well, why not? And then, for instance, he found out that it's, their meetings are in the evening and that often doesn't suit them. So he said, well, what if we make them at lunchtime? And then mm -hmm. they could join, you know, or it's they think, oh, well, I don't quite have the expertise. Well, actually, we think you do have the expertise because you know this and that, you know, so to actually have that conversation rather than assume if they think they're not suitable, they actually are not suitable. You know, so that is, I think, a powerful one. And number four is uh, once you have those women in your board to be aware that that things might change. And we all know this really, right? If you're at a birthday party or a barbecue, a group of women has a different vibe to it than a group of men. Mm. And when you mix that and you see that in work teams, the same, when you, when you see that in work teams, the same as in private uh, situations, you know, when you mix men and women, you get a different vibe. Mm. So if you're used to having those meetings with just men, and that often means hammering through points quite quickly, being really to the point, really focused, get it over and done with and you start adding women to the mix and a female energy, it is more likely you'll get a bit longer board meetings, more questions are being asked, different perspectives are brought in. And you will find the same if you add people with different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, younger people or older people, people from different industries, because they bring different perspectives. Mm. So for the chair, it's really important to support that. Mm. So rather than saying, caught how annoying everything takes a lot longer you know to actually say isn't it amazing that we're getting these different perspectives and look at how we're taking decisions and our decisions are much better grounded than they used to be so to really look at that different style as a positive which in the end it is sometimes it can find feel a bit more difficult when things change you know it's like oh no we didn't used to do it like that why is why is this changing well, actually it's because there is a different view to things. Mm. There is a new perspective. And that's actually the added value of adding uh, people from different backgrounds to your board. Absolutely. There's um, a really lighthearted, I don't know if anyone has, has seen it. It's called Pearl by Pixar. Has anybody seen that about um, little yes, I have. A little, little ball of wool. Um, it's a lovely little watch, um, and it, it's it's exactly what you were just talking about, Inga. So if anyone hasn't seen it, you can find it on YouTube. Um, but it's it's really it's really sweet, but very poignant, and but very hit, hard hitting in the in the way that she feels like she has to adapt to to get on in in this very male dominated organisation. So I can highly recommend it. It's P U R L for anyone that's looking for it. Um, again, I'll pop that in the chat. Thank I you. do also just want to uh, just say something as well. You know, you, you were saying, Inga, about using different language, female and male languages, when uh, jobs are being advertised for the board and or in senior leadership. But one of the biggest kind of feedbacks has been that as women, we try to ensure that we can cover at least 80% of the job before we actually apply. So I suppose, in essence, I, and I'll, I'll put it out to Jackie and Liz as well, how do we as women... Um, push ourselves forward to say, actually, we could do 40% of this. I just need some support on the other 60%. At what time will we be pushing ourselves forward at that moment? It's an interesting one because um, I think one of the facts that we have to recognise, you know, jobs on boards don't just come along like buses. It's it's difficult for everybody, for, for, for men and, and women. And I, I think some of my guidance is getting to know some of the chairs and working towards it. You, you're not going to do it in, in you know, a, a one and done type thing. OK, you know, I applied for that one, got it, job done, because the first one's the hardest and, and the others um, come along. I, I do think there's something about not being completely qualified. But I hesitate to say ignore it because you've got to be competent to do the job. And it's, it's about the different, you know, I, I can think of a position that I was asked to be considered for and they changed the brief. And I, I got told off by a, a, a dear friend who's a, got multiple NED positions because I said, well, I told them I can't do that. She said, why did you say that? And I'm like, because it's the truth. I'm not a tech and digital expert so I think there's a line somewhere between claiming you can do things which you patently can't mm -hmm. and pushing yourself and and there's a behavior um, along the way to be to be pushing yourself 
because much as Inger is 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 saying that there are you know um, the, the way women respond and react and think oh there's a confidence thing that that is a fact there's a confidence thing and we found that within Plan B haven't we Liz? Absolutely and if I, I can give a personal example when I had my very first NED role um, I couldn't do most of the role before I took the role if I'm really honest with you and I was promised some development which I have to say wasn't forthcoming so I was quite disappointed by that so I I made I built my own network of people on the board but people outside the board as well who I could pick up the phone to and ask really what, what seemed to be quite silly questions but actually when I asked those questions what I discovered is pretty much all my fellow board members were listening intently for the answer to those questions so I think we have to be really smart and honest about what we don't know, whether it's 60% Gemma or 80% that we just don't have that experience, that knowledge, is to put our hands up and say, I don't know, but there'll be somebody who does. And if I don't know, there's bound to be somebody else who'd be interested in the answer too. Yeah. No, no. The thing I was gonna say, um, Nikki, is that um, our colleagues in Plan B who run Plan B for hospitality actually ran a webinar um, about how to build your own board ah. and to have your own level of context to say, okay, what, you know, what, what do non-exec directors look like who look after the audit committee or, you know, what do chairs and deputy chairs look like and, and what do they need to know and, and to get focused on it. And that, that went down extremely well because people were like, I need to learn some stuff. Yeah, I know from my own point of view, when I wanted to look at non-exec positions and I asked Julie Cortens, who's obviously some of the people here might know, yes. um, who does lots of those type positions. And she just said to me, just start by, you know, because I didn't have a clue, you know, how, how does it all work? Because I've been an entrepreneur and run my own business. So, you know, I don't I don't have that kind of board environment. And she suggested just simple thing like go, go and sit as a, go, at, 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 um, at school of governors, you know, go, go and sit as a governor and you'll understand that governance part and, and what goes on and the politics and getting used to all of that stuff. And that was absolutely invaluable advice and I would never have thought of that by and it seems you know a very small step in the ocean but you know just just bits of advice like that I think can, can really help people to start realizing when they get there actually I, I am capable of being here I might not know the ins and outs of how a school works but I am bringing something else to the to the table that they don't know how so you know other things outside school school life works and so on that I can bring so I think it's about having confidence in your own own ability but I, you know there's also that kind of fake it till you make it aspect which I think Liz was probably going <laughs> but I, I think what's, what's coming out for me from this is that um, organisations, if we know that women um, apply for when, they, when they have, you know, or they won't apply if they haven't got as much, um, you know, uh, confidence Sweet. that they can do the role then perhaps it's up to organizations to help them to to nurture those relationships a little bit more and look for the talent and look for the pipeline um and perhaps they should do that a little bit more than, than they have done in the past where traditionally you know just just men would apply and i think that that obviously can come from organizations and um, is that something that you would you would advocate to organizations inga yeah, very much so. If Yeah, for women, it's looking at the requirements. You know, there is often a long list of requirements uh, for board positions. Yes. And to actually see, well, what is really essential, right? So not to say, oh, we don't need people that are underqualified. So I'm all with you there, Liz, right? I mean, or, yeah, was it Jackie, right? Where you said, yeah, you've got to be qualified in something. Yeah, but cool. we all are, you know? I mean, you're currently doing a role, you're bringing whatever 10, 20 years of experience, you're qualified in something. So what is it you are qualified in is for, I think, for women to look more at that, you know, to look at the things you can do rather than, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that. They actually think about, okay, but what can I do? And then for boards to look at what do we really, really need, you know? So if that is tech um, and, and digital, then focus on that, you know, rather than saying, oh, we need also finance, we need also um, facilities, we need also governance experience, mm -hmm. right? So you you choose a top three of things that are absolutely essential and then look for someone who can learn these other things and, mm -hmm. and make sure, yeah, give them some hints of how they can learn this. And yeah, exactly, Liz, if it's not forthcoming, then organize it yourself, right? That's very important as well. 
Um, I've got a question from from um, Lily. Thank you, Lily, for, for giving the question. She, this is around mentoring and sponsorship. So, sorry, I'm slowing my words a little bit today. I had my vaccination on Friday, and I'm not feeling a hundred percent. So, sorry, I'm not my normal sharp self. So, just bear with me. Sorry, <laughs> I'm feeling a bit nauseous and, and not feeling great. So, so bear with me. Um, right. So, mentoring and sponsorship. Now I've got my teeth in. Um, so, Lily asked this question. Thank you, Lily. Um, she said it's estimated that seven out of ten women don't have a mentor and that 50% of men in senior roles did have a sponsor so do mentoring and sponsorship go hand in hand are they the same thing or are they different um, and what can we do to improve this so um, I think probably Jackie and Liz that's probably your area of expertise here <laughs> I'm gonna let Liz talk to the detail but it's really interesting because I read something I don't know this morning or yesterday morning on LinkedIn about stop using the word mentor okay and start using the word spon sponsor I, I, I don't agree but, but it's about true mentoring, but Liz is the expert in that field. Can I ask I why you don't agree, Jackie, about mentoring and sponsorship? Why, why you don't agree that they, they should be? Yeah. I, don't, I don't agree with dropping the word mentor. Oh, I see. Sorry, I thought you meant yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I think it very much depends on the setup in an organisation, because you can have a sponsor within your organisation, but you could potentially have an external mentor. So they could be within different organizations. I think a sponsor is someone who will advocate for you in the organization. A mentor is someone who, and I always like to say, a mentor is someone who'll believe in you until you start believing in yourself. There's someone who has been, they've been there and done it and they're prepared to share with you warts and all the journey that you might be on. Um, a sponsor I think is there to sort of clear a path for you advocate for you across the, the business. So we'll mention your name in meetings, we'll mention you at board level and say, well, this, this person could be a really good, you know, director at some point in the future and just be the person that eases the way for you. So I think they are, they are different things. Yeah, to add to that, right, that regardless of what you call it, in those conversations, whether you feel you have a mentor or you would someone, like someone to be your sponsor, women typically bond more by talking about what they don't know and what they haven't done. So they, the, uh, when a woman has a conversation with a mentor, whether they're a male or a female mentor, she's more likely to go there and say, look, these are my issues. These are the things I'm struggling with. Assuming that that is what the mentor is gonna help them with. Whereas men are more likely to focus on their achievements. So they will say, look, I'm already achieving this. I'm already achieving that. Um, yeah, I, I want to get to that position. Can you help me with that? So that much more, they see these mentor, in mentor or sponsor conversations, they'd be much more strategic in saying where they want to go and what they can already do. Um, women often feel that's boasting. So to women, I'd like to say that's not boasting. It's giving information to your mentor, right? This is not about boasting. This is about being really factual about your achievements. And it's not true that you just have issues, right? So you do have achievements. Mm. So talk about those to your mentor, because otherwise your mentor doesn't get that balanced view. And the same with your sponsor, let them know where you want to go. Let them know what you've already achieved. Because I'm finding that even if you call it something different, yeah, if men have mentors, but the mentor starts sponsoring them because they, they talk about it in a different way, so they tend to have different conversations with those people supporting them. Mm. And if on the other side, if you want to sponsor women, then you need to be aware of that, right? So that if they do just talk about their issues to say, actually, I want to know where do you want to go and what are your achievements? So you have that balanced conversation yeah. the other way around. Obviously, if you're speaking with men and they just talk about their achievements to say, well, actually, wait a minute. Are there some things you're still struggling with? Because that's where I really like to help you. Mm. I think it's also really quite poignant that if whether it's a sponsor or a mentor that you tell them what you want because without that I know that as women we can kind of as you said stand back and behind lots of things instead of saying this is what I want this is where I see myself this is what I would like to have uh, etc and set those goals in those conversations because we do just want to kind of potentially stand in that 15% of oh I don't have this type of skill set to do x I need to improve this then as you said necessarily saying actually I brought this to a project and then I was able to make this saving or this operational efficiency etc so that our 
our mentors can actually really understand us and then push us in the right directions and or for those sponsors to understand well, actually, you may be doing finance at the moment, but actually, we think you'd be really great as a project manager under, you know, a new Lean Six Sigma kind of mythology or invested. Um, so it's really quite poignant for us as people, uh, as women, to also state what we want uh, mm-hmm. and not feel shy uh, that we're demanding what we want. It's just mm-hmm. making that picture very, very clear. Yeah, I agree. Lily's, Lily's posted a comment saying it's imposter syndrome. And we, we, we could have a whole webinar on imposter yeah. syndrome. Yeah, I agree. That's one. one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a pet subject for me. So, so two things. One, okay, imposter syndrome is more common in women than it is in men, but men get it too. Mm. Um, and the other thing about it is it happens most commonly in really successful people. Mm. So you wouldn't think somebody like Michelle Obama suffered from it, but she did. Mm. Uh, you, you wouldn't, you know, that there's, I can give loads of, loads of examples. Mm. So it's, 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 it's there, but it's about giving yourself a good talking to about dealing with, as Gemma's saying, the facts. Mm. You know, what, 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 what factually am I, am I um, strengths? Mm. I mean, obviously, um, in terms of, she's saying that that's why we may have less mentors or sponsors. Um, so what, how do people go about looking for mentors or sponsors? Is it what Liz was saying earlier about, you know, create your own board and your own network? Do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience with, with the mentoring programs that you've been on, Jackie? Because I know you've been a great advocate and mentor to lots of people over, over the past few years. So is this where I plug Plan B? Um, <laughs> well, your experience with mentoring to start with and then, and then, yeah. and then do your plug. <laughs> it's kind of something that's always been part of, of what I've done. Um, and, and that, you know, in my personal circumstance, I think that's coming from a very heavily matriarchal family, surprise, surprise, mm-hmm. um, who've kind of pushed women and been aspirational in terms of what they wanted um, me to achieve um, in my life. So I've mentored um, for some time and in my my uh, time in hospitality, I trained to do both coaching and, and mentoring because it's so important in an industry where people come up from the roots and move through and can become, you know, a managing director and CEO having started as a glass collector. As far as um, FM sectors um, concerned, um, I think there, it's just been a case of, it, I think it's inherent in me that paying it forward is really important. I was lucky to be sponsored by someone, by, by a couple of people in my career, who put me into jobs before I was ready, but told me they were doing that and trusted me. And, and I think the trust, building trusting relationships has been really, really important. You know, to be able to say I'm kind of scared, or similar words to that, about doing this, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Mm. And and I think for me, I can, you know, not name names, but I'm thinking of a number of people, both men and women, that I've put into positions where I've been able to replicate that and say the same thing. Say, okay, you know, you're going to get this job. Um, I have 100% confidence in you, but there's a stretch. Mm. And and I'm here to protect the gap, you know, mind the gap <laughs> to, to, of, of where that, that, that stretch is. And people will walk on broken glass for you if they think that you really believe in them and you, you know you, that you can add value to them mm, absolutely so tell us a little bit about plan b we're talking about plan b but for people who don't know what it is would you like to tell us tell us all about it let's let's Liz, Liz do that bit <laughs> Go on, Liz. so um we we have had in fm over the last few years various mentoring schemes for women and when i was the chair of women in fm we did have a mentoring scheme but it just didn't seem to have any traction. So Plan B has, uh, has existed in the hospitality sector for about four years now. And uh, it was very UK centric. Um, I think there were the matching sessions, I think Jackie took place face to face, didn't they, in, in London. Um, and Jackie introduced me to the founders of Plan B for hospitality about a year and I suppose about 16 months ago. Um, and Jackie and I at the time thought, you know, this, this sounds like it works really well. And they've had some great success with actually getting women to board level. So we said, look, why don't we do this for FM? So we ummed and ahed, didn't we, for a few months, Jackie? And then, of course, this pandemic came along. So that was sort of put a bit of a kibosh on us doing face-to-face matching sessions. So um, we embraced technology. 
and uh, we thought we could do this by Zoom. So, um, so we, we started in October. Um, the way it works is we invite people to put themselves forward as mentors or mentees. There's no real criteria for it. It's you sort of self-nominate. All we ask people to do is to give us a headshot photo, a short bio, and a reason why they've, co they've come to plan B, and then what they think they can offer as a mentor or what they would like to gain as a mentee. We then take five of each. We run a, a two hour Zoom session where we do speed matching, I suppose for want of a better term. So each mentee gets to meet each mentor for 15 minutes. Um, and then after the session, ideally that evening or the following day, we ask people to rank in order from one to five who they feel they can work with. Because what we found from this 15 minute bonding session is there's either chemistry or there isn't. And the chemistry is absolutely critical when you're working with a mentor. It's not just about that person's in a job I want to do or has got the experience I want to get. It, you've got to have that trust and that chemistry from the start. So we've so far matched 25 pairings uh, since October, very successfully. Um, pretty much everybody gets either their first or second choice. It just seems to work really well. I don't know whether we have a magic touch, but just just seems to work. Um, that's that's really how it works. And then once we match them, it's over to them. They they go and do what they want. It's driven by the mentee. So we find some of the pairings meet once a month. Some of them meet two or three times and then they're done. And we've got one pairing who keep us very much in the loop with their progress, who meet every week at the moment because the mentee is going through a very uh, important phase at work where she really needs some support and some guidance uh, to help her move to the next level. And she asked me to share a comment. So if you don't mind, I'll oh, just quote, yes, quote please, what she please. said. Mm. There's a couple, a couple of comments. She said to me, her name's Yvonne, and she said she didn't mind anybody knowing who she was. So Yvonne Thanks, said... Yvonne. Plan B Mentoring has linked me with such an amazing, experienced and inspiring mentor. I've gained valuable guidance from my mentor who never just gives the answers, but poses the right questions to allow me to apply the knowledge I have. This is then buffered by her experience to allow me to consider other options. In a very short time, it's developed my self-confidence in my own ability, and I'm so excited for the future journey. That's lovely. And I just think that's lovely. And then just a very quick quote from a, a mentor who's actually joining us this week for the first time, um, who says that Plan B is exciting, fun and relevant. And I think it's the relevant part that really fires Jackie and I up. Mm. Yeah, so that's we're like, in a we're like two we kids. <laughs> we're like two kids on the call. We have, because while they go off into the rooms, there's just the two of us um, talking. But I think it's important to stress we have both men and women mentors. Yeah. Um, we, we've had a little bit of flack of why don't you do mentoring for men? And so, yeah. clues in the title, we set up Plan B because Plan A hadn't worked. But in, in the overall thing from the founders, there's over 125 mentees have been through. Um, there's more than 200 mentors and they've got three women, actually their first board position. That's incredible. Um, and that, that seems like, you know, a small ratio, but there's a lot of people who've moved up a step mm. and moved, moved mm. up a level as well. I mean, I think it's really, it's really important that you meant, sorry, Inga. Yeah, I was going to say, to put that in perspective, right, it's not that men don't need mentors, but what you what find, find is that somehow that they find this informally. And I've seen this happen very close by with some senior male friends who were sort of, thinking about going into a board you know they had all their men approach them right this was not about them and say hey I'm soon retiring and why don't we have a call you know it's sort of they don't say oh I would like to be your mentor you know there is just why don't we have a regular call because I've got some ideas for you you know that there's sort of that real informal and and somehow men do that more, more easily to each other than to another woman and yeah for all kind, they see themselves in it they like to pay things forward it just feels natural because it comes up obviously there are also more senior men so you're also more likely 
to, to come across someone like you. So there are less senior women, so you're less likely to come across someone that recognizes themselves in you. Mm. Also, somehow women seem to do this a bit less, but there's nothing wrong with doing a formal route. So I think the reason there are formal mentoring schemes for women is mm. very specifically because often it doesn't happen so naturally and informally as it happens for many men. Yeah. Does, and does I would make... assume, actually, if you look at people with different backgrounds, for instance, the people from different races, different ethnicity, it'll be much harder for them. And you see mentoring schemes for them coming up now as mm. well. Mm. Does a mentor need to be somebody who is necessarily on a board position now? I guess if you're going in, you know, trying to get on a board, but can you have a mentor amongst peers or does anyone have a view on that? Yes, I think I think uh, really what you're looking for from a mentor is someone who has experience in the journey that you're on and experience in the area you want to go to. We, we've seen reverse reverse mentoring as well, where sometimes you can be mentored by somebody who is more junior in the hierarchy, but mm. is worked in a part of the organisation that you perhaps haven't and you want to find out more about. Mm. Um, I, I did that in... Um... In, in GSK during my last um, year there, I had a reverse diverse mentor who was junior to me in the organization, worked in a completely different function, legal, and was a Hispanic woman in the US. Mm. And it, it helped me immeasurably to be able to ask questions that maybe would be sensitive about ethnicity. Mm. And, and, and such like to say, look, I. You know, can I just ask this question the way I think it, rather than than trying to to, to go around? It, it was it was a great experience. Gemma, did JLL do something similar? I think they do. Don't yes, they? they do. I was just about to say, uh, last year we kicked off. I think there was a, a hundred uh, mentees that have signed up from uh, the board level. Uh, so we do again the diverse uh, mentoring. So it could be somebody junior or potentially in a senior position, whereby we are talking about diversity, and that's been fantastic. Uh, my mentee. Um, again, from a completely different line of the business has been fantastic because actually we're not just talking about diversity, we're also talking about our, our different functions within JLL and then our own experiences as well in being a leader. Um, and he's given me valuable advice uh, as well as the other way around as well. Uh, the other thing I would say is that we do have um, individual uh, mentees and that could be within the actual team so it may not even be the manager it may actually be your peer or your colleague that may have a little bit more experience um, and thus you know they may end up just quite naturally uh, mentoring new people that are coming onto the account or people that are coming in from a transitional period uh, for me i would definitely say uh, when i was on one of the accounts um multi-generational and then multicultural uh, there was a lot coming at me so what I did was I sat with somebody who is older than me has a different view to me and went through their journey of where they ended up from an FM perspective so I could understand them more and mm. what you know what was in play and what wasn't in play now as we've you know moved through into this new generation of uh, facilities management so for me I think it's really key and I do want to say anybody can actually be a mentor as you said if you have experience in it and you have passion in it you want to pay it forward you can step up to that plate and do that mm. I do think though that sometimes it's very hard to find a mentor um, I've been looking for a mentor for a couple of years I've tried with within companies outside of companies and I found it really really difficult to be able to find the information um, and be paired with somebody it's really nice to see that you know companies like plan b um, have these um, initiatives that are going on to actually you know really pull and engage with women um, to get them into those leadership positions so it's encouraging to actually see that but I do think there's a lot of businesses that can do more and put their hands up uh, as you said it could be weekly it could be monthly it could be bi-monthly it can suit uh, that you know the mentee and the mentor they can kind of facilitate that at the beginning and then move forward but I do think they're very valuable uh, relationships. May I ask, Gemma, why it took so long to find the, men the, the mentor for you? Was it because you were looking for something specific or what, what, were, the, what were the problems that you were coming up against? Because I think that could be really helpful to share if you don't mind sharing. No, 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 that's fine. It will help people to kind of un understand. I think for me personally, I, I went to, you know, the usual places. So the membership, IWFM, I, I went there to try and find a mentor. I went to networking events to try and find a mentor. And what I found was is that 
there wasn't anybody who really wanted to take the time to invest into me and that's that's what I found and that's what I struggled with a lot and because there isn't a you know book called please dull this mentor here if you require x it became even more frustrating to actually then try and bolt on outside of that Mm. I would definitely say since being on JLL you know we have weekly newsletters and there's lots of opportunities to be a mentor there's lots of opportunities to support from an NED perspective for a community project so Mm. That's really opened up, you know, a massive amount of doors for me. And I, actually, I can see there's a better landscape, but not all companies have that. Not all companies kind of feel that maybe mentoring is at the forefront of enabling uh, their current employees. Mm. So that's kind of what I personally came up mm. against. Um, you couldn't type in, you know, women mentorship uh, because, you know, it's tens of thousands of pounds if you want to spend I don't have tens of thousands of pounds. I just want somebody to bounce ideas off and, Mm. you know, go, am I being crazy? But, you know, I think this is really simplistic and it should be X, but they could bring in a different perception for me or something that I may not have thought about. Mm. Um, And that doesn't have to be, as I said, every week, that could be once a month, every six weeks, whenever you want to dip in and and have those sort of conversations. Mm. So, yeah. So within the Plan B programme, um, do you have a a time limit on how long a a mentor or mentee relationship should last? Because Maria's asking how long should they last? Can it go on for a long time? Or even my my question would be, should it go on for a long time? You know, should it be getting you to where you want to be and then you move on to someone else that's got a different skill set? Do do you guys have any any views on that? It's whatever suits the the, the situation. I've got a mentee that I've been working with for two years now. Mm. Um, but we've worked on different topics and she's made an extreme um, life change from where she thought she wanted to go to where she now is. She, she was heading down this road that was going to lead to misery um, and, and she's kind of come back and done something else. So that's why it's gone on that long. I've got others where I've just had one session and then others who pop up out of the blue and kind of think, oh, I forgot about you. <laughs> you know. Mm. What, what, I've had what that similar you... experience. So um, yeah. often mentoring starts with some very clear objectives because, you know, a good mentee will know what they want to start with and a good mentor will be able to ask the right questions to really form formulate those goals, those objectives. And what we tend to find is that those goals or objectives are, are met within a period of time. So it could be six months or it could be a year. What I found, and I don't know if this is the same for everybody, but the people I've had as mentors in my career have become friends. And we're still in touch. And every now and then I might just be thinking, oh, I just don't know what to do. So I will pick up the phone to one of those people. Two or three of them are retired now, but I know that I can pick up the phone and say, I don't know what to do. And they will, they'll just remind me that I do know, (laughs) and they'll share, continue to share their experience. So I think quite often a mentor becomes a friend and a friend for life. I completely uh, agree with that as well. Um, I think you pour so much of yourself into it and that vulnerability piece of being able to strip that back and say, I need help or I need guidance. So it it isn't surprising that you do become lifelong friends with these people uh, because they're making sure, you know, that number one, you are successful. Um, So that's really, really nice. Um, And then they're never going to give you an answer that will see you fall flat on your face. So it's nice to hear that, you may have had it for, you know, six months, 12 months or just one session. Uh, but you may find that, as you said, they're in your repertoire of giving them a quick call and saying, oh, you know what, this happened today or I need some help for this. Oh, yes, I remember doing I did X, Y and Z. So it's kind of that sounding board and knowing that you're in that safe space and you can be vulnerable at the same time, which obviously gives you the confidence to be able to, you know, continue in your own journeys. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so if you wanted to become, if you wanted to join the Plan B Mentoring, what, how do people go about that, Liz? Well, it's, I have to say it's, it's very simple. It's free and it's accessible. <laughs> so Great. all people need to do is to get in touch with Jackie or I or go to the Plan B website where they can actually um, go to the, uh, there's an FM section on it and uh, they can just give their details there and then we'll get back in touch with them. It's, it's as simple as get in touch, give us your photo, short bio, reasons why and uh, and then we'll invite you along to one of our sessions simple free accessible it's interesting that um emma emma causa who i would say is the true founder of plan b because she ran a thing called athena before that and really struggled with it found it very administratively heavy and 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 got this together but emma has just moved freakily 
um, to the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. So mm-hmm. she's now coming into, um, coming from hospitality, coming into this world. Um, I know that they're looking at a built environment plan B. And she had an inquiry, and this one, just to show you that there are some good things happening out there, from two male consultant orthopedic surgeons who said women don't come into this sector because it's a very physically demanding job. You have to be pretty smart as well. but um, And we want to attract more, more people to the sector. How can we build a plan B for orthopedic surgeons? So if there's any of those on the call, I'll let you know when they've, they've uh, found it. But yeah, it, it can go anywhere. Fantastic. And um, what about um, if you're in a senior position, how do you go about sponsoring somebody? What, what should you what should you be doing? Are there any more formal kind of programs for that? Or is it just literally about being an advocate for that person and championing them, you know, in, in internally? What, what can people be doing if they didn't want to go down the formal um, mentoring route, but they, but they wanted to still, you know, pay it forward, but don't have as much time, perhaps? What, what can they do around sponsorship? I think we all see people in our organisations who kind of put their hand up quite, sometimes quite low. And they're sort of they're looking for a bit of help and I think it's our responsibility to spot them and I remember when I first started working in FM there was a phrase about you know there are women in our industry who climb to the top and then pull the ladder away Mm. I don't see that anymore I really don't I genuinely see some really amazing senior women in facilities management particularly who are there to support and help but we've got to just put our head above the parapet a little bit to get noticed so I think it's a two-way street I, I hear that a lot. And Inga, I'd be really interested to bring you in on that because you were nodding <laughs> when, when uh, Liz said that. And, you know, there has been that perception in the past. And does that come from, well, there's only one space for one woman on a board. So therefore, once I'm there, I'm going to protect my, my, my space um, furiously. Or, what, you know, where do you think that, that, that kind of attitude has come from in the past? And do you one think there's been a change, as, as Liz thinks there is? Do you think there has been a change as well? I think, one, it's quite, it's a myth. You know, I, there is this real persistent belief that women don't help each other which has not been my experience and when you actually ask women most women will say I had someone really really help me and I mean in my case I worked in Siemens and Shell my career hadn't gone anywhere without sponsorship from men and women that were senior to me you know and I have always found both men and women very supportive of my career so and when I share that story other women will go yeah me too yeah me I don't recognize it so it's it's somehow a bit of a myth and I think where and it does exist and where it does happen I think is um and and yeah that it's sort of the queen bee behavior you get is where as a as someone who's different you know for instance female you know you're the only one you need to do a lot of effort to to show that you're one of the guys, that you're one of us rather than one of them. So let's say in your organization, and this was for instance, the case in Siemens, you know, I was the only female engin- uh, project engineer, which means that all other females are uh, in finance or assist in assistant roles, right? So then when you come in, people will sort of assume you're the assistant. So if you've had that for a long time, you do, do an effort to sort of instantly distinguish yourself from other women. It's a bit like, oh, I'm not actually a woman. I'm one of you guys. Mm -hmm. And when you've done that for a while, uh, another woman coming in could easily dent your image of that so carefully crafted as, you know, I'm just as just as senior as you. I'm just as good a leader as you. If she doesn't quite fit into the mold you've created and that's the moment where women are quite care maybe not all of them right but where women sometimes in the past have been quite careful to sort of not yeah just to be scared that their own carefully built glass house might be shattered by another woman coming in and doing things differently and I mean why would it be a woman that has to help a woman you know why can't it be I mean if there's like 10 men in a board and two women there is a sort of expectation that those women have to bring other women in well why I mean yeah I've had a lot of male sponsors and I don't see why anyone else couldn't have that either so yeah that's yeah where it comes from it's definitely no and now that you see increasingly more women in those senior roles and in boards of course it's yeah those women haven't had to work so hard to preserve that image Mm. And there are more styles possible. You don't have to try and be one of the guys. You can actually just be who you are and bring your own strength. And we mm. see that, you know, there used to be 
one female, like a Margaret Thatcher kind person, you know, an iron lady. Or in India, you had to, um, oh, what's her name, Indira, Indira Gandhi, you know, the, the sort of Indian iron lady. Uh, whereas nowadays, there is a much wider range of female role models. Mm -hmm. You know, just look at Yacinda Sinda Arden in New Zealand, Angela Merkel, Muti Merkel, you know, that's got nothing to mm -hmm. do with, you know, here is some kind of male hero type model, you know, mm -hmm. Muti Merkel is, yeah, there is much more of a supportive vibe that comes from that. Um, here in the UK, we've had uh, Mrs. May, Theresa May, right? So there are throughout the world and there are several, um, Norway has a, a female um, prime minister. There are so many female role models now out there mm -hmm. that also women have much more variety to choose from. So they no longer have to fit in that one sort of, I'm one of the guys mold. So it's really possible now to be yourself and bring your own strength to the table. Yeah. Absolutely. It's interesting, you know, that, that, that you talk about there about the different countries, Inga, because um, I was just looking at some stuff before we, we came on today. And um, I hope I get this number right, but there are seven female CEOs in the FTSE 100 at the moment. Mm -hmm. In Thailand, 30% of their CEOs are women. Mm -hmm. And in China, which to me, having done work there, is a, is a bigger surprise, approaching 20%. So there are countries that get this much more right. Oh, and yeah. that was not, the, not that was women it. can't do it, or women yeah. have the case. No, 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 but I mean, attention, right? it's crazy. they bite the bullet and do it. It's expected, yeah. and where that's just what you do. Yeah, that brings me perfectly onto the next thing, because obviously we started this, this um, hour out with, you know, how do we achieve, achieve gender parity? Um, you know, does, does it have to be that it, if we go down the quota route? I know people have very strong views against that. And, you know, I know, I know this, this will create debate and that's what we're here for. You know, so how, how, what should we be aiming for? Should we be aiming for 50-50 or, you know, or, or should we just let it naturally and organically get to where it needs to get to? Or, you know, what should we be doing about this? Um, quotas, I know everyone's got a strong view, but what's your view on quotas? <laughs> Um, I'm not I'm not a fan of quotas and I would I would take a very different approach I would take a very results focused approach yeah. so there's a fantastic book by Matthew Syed called Rebel Ideas and what he's talking about in there is diversity of thought so he said it's not necessarily about diversity of gender or ethnicity or education it's it's how we think differently so I think as an organization if I want to build a board where we are getting results because we're thinking differently, I'm going to target individuals who think in a different way to us. Mm. Um, so it's for me, it wouldn't have, wouldn't be about quotas. It would be about how do we get the results we want. Yeah, personally, I think quotas do more damage than good. But um, Jackie, do you have a view? Yeah, I do. It's 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 what I call a watermelon metric because the Hampton Alexander um, report said we wanted to be at thirty three percent. Um, of FTSE 100 boards to be female by the last year, 2020. Mm -hmm. And everybody's slapping themselves on the back because it's 36.2%. Mm -hmm. 32 of those 100 companies haven't achieved the number. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, it looks great on the surface, but when you go a level below, there's companies that still don't have mm -hmm. women, women on boards. And I think it needs to be more normalised. Mm -hmm. um, You've got to set, I mean, I don't necessarily fall out with, I mean, coming from a business which is very metric driven, I don't necessarily fall out with, with setting targets, but the targets won't drive the change. The mm. behaviour will drive the change. Mm. And so I think, you know, if you believe what gets measured gets done, um, it's the behaviour that's going to make those numbers mm those numbers work and why wouldn't it be 50 50 when that's what the population is yeah absolutely absolutely and there's mckinsey research that says i think the number six percent improved profits from diverse boards why, why wouldn't you do it even even if it's not for being the right thing yeah but because it's commercially sensible as well 
that's the overwhelming thing isn't it i mean through the whole kind of theme of all of the all of these webinars that we do is that you know it's as morally it's the right thing to do but but business you know the bottom line it affects the bottom line you know if you're if you're a board and you know you need you need a diverse board to understand your customer base which will be di diverse that's what the world is today and you know you, you know can consumer products do better where there's there's some um, mixed and uh, more diverse um teams and you know new business development in every every aspect it just makes perfect sense inga do you have a view on um, how, how do we how do we move forward because we, we're getting close to the end of the, the hour so um do you have, have an, an overview as to how do we achieve this gender parity well, I think targeted objectives are a great idea, which is, I yeah. think, something different from a quota, right? A quota is something legal, where you set legal, which they mm -hmm. actually have in Switzerland, which they have in France, which they have in Norway, which they have sort of not in the Netherlands, where I'm from originally. So in the Netherlands, there's more of a, a target, which you're expected to get. But what you do see is when you set quotas, targets and objectives, um, it changes behavior sometimes negatively you know people mm. start complaining about it and and they they put like i don't know um dummy women on in places but what i have seen in the netherlands there's been a lot of discussion about those targets but over the last 20 years and there have been a lot of targets over those 20 years initially there was a lot of talk of oh she's only here because she's a woman yeah however in her second and her third role no one says that anymore so I think when you start these targets and objectives, there's a lot of pushback. When people just see these people performing, that just goes. Mm. So there is, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, uh, there is a lot of pushback. I don't think it works very well, quotas in the English culture, but targets mm. and objectives, definitely, because it, if you give throughout an organization people, and we, we see that for promoting women as well, you tell um, managers that they need to, uh, have a particular percentage of females that they recruit or that they promote, they will start looking for ways to do that. So they will start, they have more of an incentive to go the extra mile to look for women, to pick up the mm. phone and speak with them, to use that gender inclusive language, to reduce the number of criteria and really look for th that the sort of really criteria they need. They have that incentive to take to look at what the barriers might be and take those away. Mm. So, and they'll find that information, right? If there's no, it does take extra effort initially. It is mm. ju not just oh, you just ask someone you've met and you liked and you think is suitable. You know, you have to to sort of start putting yeah. an effort in to meet those people, to ask mm. them, to build those new relationships, which maybe is slightly harder, it's slightly out of your comfort zone. Mm. So. If you start, to, yeah, yeah, I think that's sort of, so I think, yeah, targets and objectives, definitely quotas may not fit in, in the English culture. Mm. What but I was going to say, sorry, Nikki, just off the back of um, everybody saying about having diversity, because it enables the bottom line as well, you know, diverse thought brings, you know, great uh, innovation. Um, but one of the biggest things I think, which is a big change, is that when clients are looking to engage with an FM company, they also want to see that diversity. And mm -hmm. that is also being driven uh, through through this. And I think that's really important to, to understand and remember. So any businesses that are out there that aren't thinking about having diversity within their teams, they will start to see that really affecting their bottom line as they try to retain and then potentially win new business as well. Mm -hmm. And, and also, we see that at the cleaning. moment, Nikki, in the offshore wind sector, we see it uh, where in the infrastructure sector, where the government expects these things now in proposals, which is not quite a quota, but they yeah. actually have uh, agreements with the sector in how much subsidy they get mm -hmm. in return for putting more effort in ethnic and racial mm -hmm. diversity mm -hmm. and gender diversity. Mm -hmm. And that is now suddenly moving the dial forward. Everyone is starting to put budget and resources towards these. And I've written both sectors I've worked to write best practice guides on how to do this. Um, that just means things are happening. Information is being shared. Teams are starting to share best practices, which I'm involved in. I'm giving advice um, to several of those committees. None of that would have happened without clients setting those objectives. Mm. 
I'd also like to point out as well, there was a recent report um, from one of the big four that surveyed um, you know, young talent com coming into organisations, the millennials, and 67% of them say that diversity is the most important thing that they will look at when looking at an organisation. So again, you know, companies have got to look at their talent pipeline and their leaders of the future and recognise that this isn't just a nice to have anymore. This is a demand, you know, seven out of 100 is in the FTSE 100 is just not acceptable. And people are, these figures are being published now and we're all recognising the fact that we're having this conversation this afternoon. You know, that the people like you, you know, writing your books, that the work that Jackie and Liz are doing with Plan B and so on, you know, everybody, you know, JLL do have a fantastic diversity programme. Everybody's, you know, trying to come together to get this done. But, you know, if, if people don't want to work for your organisation or people don't want to buy your products for whatever organisation that you are, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a nice to have anymore. It, it's a must have almost. Most, isn't it I was just really interested to know around you know what happens with those targets and objectives when they just you know they're, they're a nice to have, if they're a nice to have rather than an essential and they they kind of just you know so that they don't get met then who has the teeth what teeth do does government have or society have to actually police that and I think that's we all I think have to take personal responsibility I think those yeah. of us in leadership roles and not even in leadership roles those of us who've got a voice we have a responsibility. So I, I know I'm, I'm a, I love connecting people. It's what I do, networking. Mm -hmm. And I know that people will, you know, engage with things I say, they might not always agree, but I think I have a responsibility now to talk for others. So, you know, if anybody reached out to me and said, Liz, can you help? I would do my very best to help because I, that's my role. Thank you so much, everyone, today. I hope that this session has been useful to everybody. There will be a recording, um, which I'll send out the link that you can access it. So do share it with friends, colleagues, or anyone you think that might get any benefit from it. Just want to thank our panelists so much today for joining us. Thank you so much for your, for your input and look forward to seeing you at the next one, which will be the third Tuesday, which is, you know, we've got a diary handy. Okay. We're always the third, we're always the third Tuesday of the month at four o'clock, just in case anyone's not sure. And we're going to be talking about inclusive workplaces. Let me just give be you the that 18th. Of... Thank you very much, Jim. Um, yeah, that'll be the 18th at four o'clock. We're going to be talking about inclusive workplaces. So thanks very much for being here today, everyone. And um, yeah, the recording will come out on an email to you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.